I'm going to get started. Just um, two preliminary notes. The first is that we like run pretty close uh, to time here. If people have questions, we're going to move down to the youth wing afterward uh, to take them. The second is that I do have a number of images that I'm going to be talking about um, as I go through this evening. If you have the app and you have my like presentation pulled up, you'll see them on the, the slides there. Um, so those are just our, our kind of two things by, by, by way of introduction, and otherwise I think we can get started. So the theme of this year's Night of Philosophy and Ideas, of course, is to uh, a, topic, a topic so generously vague as to allow every speaker a little niche within it. Uh, but in all honesty, such an effusive theme does permit a bit of a challenge for me as a scholar who works extensively on death in its many forms. From terrorism and political nihilism to neo-fascism and the changing nature of violence. It's all cupcakes and unicorns, as I like to say. Uh, so in keeping what I know best, I'd like to consider with you how the basic desire to live operates in America today. What it fuels, what it forecloses, and how it dissolves in freakishly dialectical terms into its opposite. I want us to consider, in short, what type of life we can have while always looking out for death. So if you have your slides, or if your neighbor has slides, you want to pull them up. I'm gonna, we're going to look at the first kind of slide here, which is this image of this <laughs> Heltec shotgun, 12 gauge shotgun, with the advertisement that says, Mi casa no es su casa. This is an advertisement that was released last summer for Keltec's new KS7 12 gauge shotgun. With its bullpup design and long pistol grip, it looks a little like the models we brought pheasant hunting when I was young. And indeed, while the company notes that the KS7 has a range of applications, it's marketed chiefly as a tool of home defense. Moreover, the advertisement's choice of language, mi casa, no es su casa, suggests that Caltech customers have a particular type of intruder in mind when they envision themselves heroically defending their homes and families, and that he came from south of the border. Never mind, of course, that immigrants are no, likely, no more likely to commit crimes than native-born Americans, or that the inverse, in fact, appears to be true. Like most companies, Caltech is happy to tap into and further cultivate a Trumpian narrative as long as it pads the bottom line. You see, when it comes to the domestic firearms market, it turns out that fear sells better than anything else. And in a stroke of almost providential luck for the gun industry, Americans have become experts at selling fear. The United States is in the throes of a gun violence epidemic. Nearly 40,000 people died of gun-related deaths in 2017, the last year for which we have complete data. Mass shootings like those in El Paso and Odessa, Texas have become commonplace, and the alarming number of school shootings has spawned its own secondary market of bulletproof backpacks and ballistic safety blankets. As these products suggest, entrepreneurs have been far more successful commoditizing a chance at survival than we of citizens have been securing even a modicum of gun control. We want to live, and we especially want our children to live, but we seem to have abandoned the hope of doing so without constant fear. Indeed, behind all the statistics about American gun violence, there's one in particular that I think speaks to our concerns. A landmark survey conducted in 2016 by researchers at Harvard and Northwestern found that 63% of gun owners now identify protection against people as their primary reason for ownership. Notably, fear of others far outstripped hunting or recreation, a complete reversal from the last time such data was systematically collected in 1994. This is no small feat, given that the actual rhymes of violent crime have declined precipitously over the same period. According to the FBI, the property crime rate declined 42% from 1998 to 2017, as did rates of burglary, down 50%, larceny, down 38%, and aggravated assault, down 31%. We are, in empirical terms, safer than ever, yet you would hardly know it based on our spending patterns. The market for home security systems is thriving, having grown 22% annually between 2011 and 2018, with projected yearly growth of 20% through 2024. Apps like Citizen and Nextdoor feed off the public perception that crime is getting worse, even as actual data indicate otherwise. Parents can buy GPS trackers for children who are, as numerous studies have shown, given less freedom to wander than those of us who grew up in the 80s or 90s. And as the research I cited earlier corroborates, the culture of fear also sells guns, driving a manufacturing boom that the National Shooting Sports Foundation, America's Firearm Industry Trade Association, characterizes as nothing short of remarkable. 
The uptick in U.S. gun manufacturing from 2.9 million total firearms in, 20, in 2001 to a peak of 11.5 million in 2016, so nearly five times as many in, in the course of 15 years, has been fueled chiefly by rapid growth in the handgun and rifle market. Among the latter four category, assault weapons of the sort popularized by mass shooters have served as the engine of growth. Consider, for instance, Smith & Wesson's popular M&P-15, a semi-automatic assault rifle introduced after the ban of such weapons expired in 2004. Smith & Wesson manufactured just over 4,600 of them in 2006, but that figure had ballooned to almost 400,000 by 2016. The company's success offered a model that has been broadly copied. Take something associated with hunting and transform it into a tricked out tool of self-defense or as these things sometimes go, offense. The strategy has proved particularly valuable to gun manufacturers and sellers as the real number of American hunters continues to dwindle and is now estimated at only 4% of the population. According to the NSSF, the firearms growth industry growth has, quote, been driven by an unprecedented number of Americans choosing to exercise their fundamental right to keep and to bear arms. Explanations of this kind paint a picture of Americans coming to the light waking to the sanctity of the Second Amendment. But the rapid uptick in gun manufacturing since the turn of the century and the documented link between gun ownership and fear points to a darker side of the American gun boom. Who are we so afraid of? Why? And how are these shifts changing what it means to live? If you have your slides, I'm gonna be talking a little bit now about the next one. <laughs> The criminal element is out in our community. We do see that on the news every single day. There's much to unpack in this comment by Ed O'Connell, which appears at the outset of a promotional video for the National Rifle Association's award-winning crime prevention program, Refuse to Be a Victim. Geared toward helping people identify potential threats to their safety, from would-be burglars to rapists, the program has offered thousands of training seminars nationwide since 1993. As they tell it, Refuse to be a Victim was founded at the request of NRA members and staffers who were concerned about the uptick in violent crime in America, particularly against women. And though both men and women attend the program seminars, the gendered threat is central to the promotional video. Cliché clips that could be borrowed from Law & Order Special Victims Unit show white women being trailed by shadowy figures, dressed in black and presumably looking to do them harm. The implicit suggestion of racial difference can hardly be viewed as innocent, and indeed, the overwhelming whiteness of the video is startling. When O'Carroll makes repeated references to, quote, our community, it's not a stretch to assume that few people of color reside there. By participating in one of the program's hundreds of annual trainings, you can learn to be afraid of things that go far beyond walking through dark alleys, things you never even thought to fear. For example, don't leave your insurance information in your glove compartment. Your valet might photograph it and burglarize your home while you're away. Make sure to cut wide hedges when out walking, lest you miss the person waiting to ambush you around the hedge. And never ever do laundry late at night in a communal laundry room, lest you get raped, murdered, and thrown into the trash compactor. Indeed, and despite FBI statistics charting the significant decline in violent crime, the program stresses just how unsafe you really are, saying, according to the FBI, in 2016, there were an estimated 1,248,185,000 uh, violent crimes reported to law enforcement. That's one violent crime every 25 seconds. <laughs> As I found out over the course of my three-hour training seminar, refusing to be a victim requires a new mindset altogether. One that is constantly surveying situations, guarding encounters with others, and never ever trusting strangers. When I asked if it would be advisable to hitch a ride to a gas station in the event that my car broke down, my instructor indicated that the police would probably never find my body. But mostly, I was told, ad nauseum, of the need to find my inner mama bear and protect myself and my three young children by any means necessary. Here it is fascinating to note that a whole subculture has grown up around women gun owners in particular that co-ops feminist language regarding agency and empowerment. This is certainly the theme of recently published books like Thank God I Had a Gun, True Accounts of Self-Defense, and Hashtag Me Too, Women Who Shot Men in Self-Defense. Uh, I have some images of these on your, your slideshow as well. Forget waiting for some policeman in shining body armor to come to your rescue. You can be the hero in your own story. 
Now, thinking about the, cult, the, the, the culture of constant vigilance that refused to be a victim cultivates with its persistent fear of the unknown, leads us toward a very different set of phenomena. It struck me that this program has little in common with the gun safety or marksmanship courses that used to be the bread and butter of the NRA, but it could be a close cousin of counterterrorism campaigns like New York City's famed, if you see something, say something. And indeed, my training was taught by a retired counterterrorism officer, and variations of the city's well-known tagline were everywhere. In the years since the attacks of September 11th, security, of course, has become something of a national pastime. And for the most part, we have been complacent in furthering its agenda. We dutifully decant our liquids into three ounce containers and present them to TSA agents for inspection. We find ways to justify government agencies tapping our phone conversations. After all, in the age of Facebook, who can be so precious about privacy? Uh, if we see something, we say something. Americans, large and small, have been enlisted as foot soldiers in the security war, becoming expert risk mitigators and adopting a stance of constant vigilance. This is, as we have been told, the price we must pay for safety. To live now means always looking out for death around the corner. Now against this background of hypervigilance, American gun violence appears in stark relief, pointing toward a central contradiction. We spend billion annually protecting ourselves from terrorism, but treat mass shootings by homegrown assailants as a natural order of the universe about which we can do very little. The former requires endless sacrifice of our rights, our money, our soldiers, indeed of our democracy, while the latter offers an insurmountable challenge that we cannot, we cannot tackle without undermining our sacred liberties. How do we account for this strange set of affairs? So on the one hand, it is clear that we possess a formidable ideological apparatus that taps into deep-seated assumptions about us and them. Contemporary political rhetoric depends on the division between real Americans and all sorts of threatening outsiders. Muslims and immigrants especially, but as we will see, otherness is a capacious category. That xenophobia has increased precipitously during this a period of record corporate profitability, accelerating rates of inequality, wage stagnation for most workers, and even a decline in life expectancy is more than a strange coincidence, I believe. So that's a story for a different time. What is relevant for our inquiry is the almost boundless tolerance for the violence we inflict upon ourselves. Thus, determining what is terrorism and what is tragedy often hinges on little more than religious, affilia uh, religious affiliation. White mass shooters, of course, are routinely described as unstable or mentally ill, whereas similar attacks by Muslims, such as the shootings at the Pulse nightclub or the San Bernardino office building, are narrated chiefly as instances of religious fanaticism. Indeed, it's hard to imagine a scenario in which the routine mass shooting by anyone other than white American men would be met with such profound levels of resignation. But we'd be missing half the story if we look for answers solely on the ideological plane, important as the rhetorical and racialized division between insiders and outsiders may be. More fundamentally, we might ask who benefits from this deadly status quo. Because the seeming contradiction mentioned above, endless sacrifice for the sake of the war on terror, nary a move to restrict domestic arms, makes perfect sense from the perspective of maximizing profit, and few developments have driven sales in the century more than the culture of endless and boundless war. It is not here just that the specter of racial, ethnic, and religious difference serves a starring role in the ideological scaffolding that supports the market for arms. It's that we've brought the war home. One way to track the interrelation between fear, otherness, and profit is to examine gun sales in the wake of racially charged events. The election of Barack Obama to the presidency, for example, sent firearm sales and concealed handgun permits to an all-time high. The upward trend continued unabated through his presidency, tending to spike in the wake of every mass shooting and corresponding call for gun control legislation. The central irony was that despite his perceived hostility to the Second Amendment, Obama became, and I quote, the greatest gun salesman in America. As one Las Vegas shop gun shop owner, Bob Irwin, characterized the situation in 2016, it started with San Bernardino, but Obama has just added to it. You didn't have to go to the wrong place at the wrong time to get murdered. It was like the Paris attacks, but here. Irwin's statement was meaningful in ways he perhaps did not intend. Not only did he mention attacks in San Bernardino and Paris, both of which were linked to the Islamic State, rather than the many mass shootings perpetrated, per per perpetrated by white homegrown killers, but his observation that you didn't have to go to the right, the wrong place at the wrong time to get murdered reflects a world in which the relationship between cause and effect is essentially broken down. 
Violence has become randomized, which means that danger is lurking everywhere, and you never know when you might be called upon to play the role of citizen Superman. In his address to the NRA last summer, President Trump also spoke at length about the Paris attacks and claimed that, quote, if there was one gun being carried by one person on the other side, it very well could have been a very different result. Great Trump syntax there. Um, now, of course, the likelihood that a civilian carrying a pistol could take out numerous assailants armed with automatic rifles is extremely unlikely, but it is meaningful that such fantasies still, prefer, still perform a certain type of political work. So, too, it is meaningful, I think, that nearly four years after the Paris attacks, since which, uh, since which there have been dozens of domestic mass shootings, the president chose to focus on Islamic terrorism and to link this threat in particular to the sanctity of American gun rights. If the imperative to live has become bound up with the right to bear arms in certain quarters, we should remember how unevenly that sense of security is experienced. From Jim Crow attempts to disarm African Americans to police shootings of black children brandishing toy weapons, and the endless talk of, quote, black-on-black -black violence, the association between blacks and illicit gun use is rampant. Indeed, the suggestion of black lawlessness and criminality poses the perfect symbolic counterpoint to those reasonable law-abiding -abid presumably white gun owners about which we hear so much. Physician Jonathan Metzl surveys much, of this, surveys much of this contentious territory in dying of whiteness, which chronicles how the politics of racial resentment exacerbate public health crises. As he stated in a recent interview, a number of people I talked to in my book basically said, I'm getting this gun because of Ferguson. These are people who live 300 miles from Ferguson in entirely white areas of rural America. When I tried to pin them down about it, they would say, this could happen anywhere. I have to protect myself and my property. Now, for its part, the National Rifle Association has long capitalized on the association of blacks with criminality, but its true talent has been to push this discourse into more expansive territory. In a 2017 promotional video set against the backdrop of broken glass, burning cars, and protesters holding signs that read, this is war, NRA spokeswoman Dana Loesch suggests that guns are the only logical way to restrain the lawlessness of the resistance. If you have slides, you can look at a number of stills that I took from this uh, NRA video, starting with the, the trash cans on their side and continuing to the poster that says, this is war. Seamlessly aligning between a broad swath of recent protests, Loesch took aim at liberal America in all its guises. They use their media to assassinate real news. They use their schools to teach children that their president is another Hitler. They use their movie stars and singers and comedy shows and award shows to repeat their narrative over and over again. And then they use their ex-president to endorse the resistance, all to make them march, make them protest, make them scream racism and sexism and xenophobia and homophobia, to smash windows, burn cars, shut down interstates and airports, bully and terrorize the law abiding until the only option left is for the police to do their jobs and to stop the madness. Loesch calls a, concludes the video by calling upon NRA supporters to quote, fight this violence of lies with a clenched fist of truth, explicitly aligning her constituency with the forces of law and order. Yet not that long ago, the NRA preached a very different message vis-a-vis -vis state power. You may recall Wayne Lapierre once characterized the assault weapons ban as a granting, quote, jackbooted government thugs more power to take away our constitutional rights, break in our doors, seize our guns, destroy our property, and injure or kill us. Though liberals often imagine gun owners as delusional libertarians assembling arsenals to defend against government tyranny, Loesch's message reflects a substantive shift. Our brave men and women in uniform need you, citizen soldier, to join them in protecting America from its foes, domestic and foreign. In this vein, it's noteworthy that Shooting, Ill Shooting Illustrated's review of Caltech's KF-7 praises the gun as, quote, lighter and shorter than many submachine guns, noting it delivers firepower on par with the much longer and heavier riot guns of conventional design. It's just what you need to support the forces of law and order. The realignment of American gun culture to support the coercive powers of the state might be another disturbing harbinger of domestic fascism, but we arguably need to look beyond our shores to understand why it has occurred. Indeed, the war on terror, which has been waged alongside the expansion of the domestic arms market, lurks like a shadow in American gun culture today, molding its language and stoking its fears. And in particular, the war on terror has come to shape the way we think and treat outsiders writ large. 
It is striking in this regard that the shift toward home defense and firearms marketing parallels the acceleration of a political agenda characterized by Muslim bans and border walls. These considerations point toward a convergence between the domestic and the foreign, personal and the political, in which we have come to associate that which is unknown with, with that which is threatening. Reading the Department of Homeland Security's 2019 budget leaves no doubt that the ever-present, though statistically insignificant threat of terrorism, its vocabulary, bottomless budget, and appeals to sacrifice, helps underwrite the current assault on immigration. DHS identifies securing our borders as a top national security concern, noting that doing so is necessary, quote, to stem the tide of illicit goods, terrorists, and unwanted criminals. Never mind, of course, that we have no reported cases of a terror attack carried out by an individual who crossed America's southern border, or that the State Department found that more terrorists and suspects have historically come through Canada or arrived by air. The mere mention of terrorists has an almost magical effect, rendering palatable that which might not pass muster on rational grounds alone, from domestic spying to ch children in cages. Much like Dan Alosha's promotional spot, the DHS's elision between terrorists, criminals, and immigrants teaches us something very elemental. Our others are proliferating at an alarming rate, demanding true patriots to step up and defend real America. This is another way to understand the surge in gun sales since 2001. We have been enlisted as soldiers in the security agenda and tasked with the defense of the homeland. If you look uh, at the kind of final set of slides here, these like last few images, these kind of combat situation. These are these are the, the, these are advertisements for weapons that are available and openly marketed to civilians, mind you. So in this context, it's no coincidence that the MNP in Smith and Wesson's popular MNP 15 stands for military and police. According to a regulatory fi filing of the FEC, uh, MNP branded modern sporting rifles are specifically designed to satisfy the functionality and reliability needs of global military law enforcement and security personnel. The gun advertisements openly appeal to a military civilian crossover market, suggests that the war abroad and violence at home might be more deeply intertwined than we usually recognize. Though they may not volunteer for service in Afghanistan, it turns out that many Americans are eager to play soldier in their own backyards. And as Dana Loesch suggests, the war is already here. In an essay written in 1936, Walter Benjamin took note of the changes that had occurred over the course of the 19th century regarding the social experience of death. Once a regular feature in the rooms of every home and the cycle of human life, death had been banished, quarantined in hospitals and isolated in cemeteries outside of town. Loss of faith in the promise of eternity seemed to produce a corresponding desire to put death out of sight and out of mind. We too live in a disenchanted world, one in which the promise of heavenly delights cannot compensate for our lack of earthly ones. We are certainly no more comfortable with death than our 19th century predecessors, but our collective response has not been to banish death from view, but rather to mitigate it through what I've called the culture of constant vigilance. Yet we must not lose sight of the fact that not everyone experiences the effects of this culture in the same way. On the contrary, as a set of discourses and practices that hinges on the distinction between insider and outsider, American and foreigner, us and them, the culture of constant vigilance, vigilance reproduces and indeed intensifies the structural role of racism in our political and social lives. For instance, crime apps like Nextdoor have been embroiled in a number of controversies related to who precisely qualifies as a suspicious person and how racial bias plays into this determination. The biggest annoyance I am likely to face when flying is being asked to remove my shoes. While my, while my Muslim counterparts face TSA screening as yet another instance in which their mere presence generates alarm. As such, it is not a culture whose effects are evenly felt. White Americans may recognize the destructiveness of these dynamics, but we are not in the crosshairs in the same way. In closing, I'd like to argue that any consideration of what it means to live must take stock of how its dialectical twin to die makes its presence felt across a broad spectrum of political and social phenomena. When fear of death becomes so closely entwined with fear of others, as I have suggested is the case in both with the domestic gun culture and the war on terror, mitigating death increasingly means mitigating the human dignity of people who are not like us, a particularly nebulous term at this historic juncture. The challenge of our time will be articulating a more generous and capacious sense of what it means to be safe and secure. 
one in which there is more room for others to live as well. Thank you. It, let's have anyone who wants to ask questions, we're going to decamp to the youth wing. So just let the room turn over for the next. Thank you all.